this day. We thank you for your wondrous love to us. We ask now as we open up in not only prayer and, and hymns, but that our hearts might be singing praise to you and that our minds might be centered upon you and our whole being might be focused for one purpose this day, and that is to glorify, honor, and worship you. We ask you again, Lord, to bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Complete in thee. song has got good words. On the second. Thank you. 
So I put two more down and then moved two to the side. And that, that kind of gives us that. I, I diminished the inside row a little bit over what it was last week, but I really hate to diminish that too much. Um, we need the room on the sides and, and, and in the center to get to our seats uh, comfortably. I could remove some of the, the distance between the rows, but I did not like that idea either. Um, so. Just understanding, unless we have to, we'll, we'll leave that over. Um, we had a 32, is that correct, last Sunday? And so uh, usually what you'll find is when you get to about 75 to 80% of the seats filled, you'll not get anybody else to stay. They will come and they will go. And so that's what we're trying to do, um, to, to be sure that we don't get to that. Uh, we have that room that they feel comfortable. Have you ever noticed some people when they come in, they, they, if they're new, they just kind of get off to the side? And we try not to let that happen here. <laughs> Our goal is to, and I hope this doesn't sound bad, just to absorb them. You know, we want them to become a part. And, and you know, I have not said this enough, but we have a, a group here that is very friendly. And, and praise the Lord for that. Not every church you go into is friendly. As a matter of fact, some are quite rigid, I guess would be the best way. I don't want to say cold, um, but they're, they're rigid. And so uh, I praise the Lord that uh, it's like the little kid running around. We have one in our area, and I don't want to call his name, but we have a little fella. And uh, I was out working, and he ran up to me and just started talking. <laughs> and I looked, and I seen his parents coming. And um. Uh, he just kept talking and asking questions, not that I minded, but it kind of shocked me because he was very young. I would say three, four maybe. And so I, when his parents got there, I said, he doesn't know strangers, does he? They said, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's something you have to be careful with in, with children, but it's something that in a church you really won't. You don't want people to feel like strangers when they step into your midst. They want them to feel like they're at home. And I so appreciate that. So thank you so much for being friendly, for welcoming, welcoming our visitors in. And so now if you would turn to Judges chapter 11. I will add one more thing. Uh, Jean is not feeling well this morning. She did not sleep well last night. And so um, uh, she does have uh, a health condition. Let me encourage you that as we go through the day, as we go through our, our lesson this morning and in the sermon um, today, that you would take time as the Lord brings her to mind to pray for her. And I um, think also of uh, uh, Mr. Mickey, um, and uh, we have others uh, that we don't see often, um, or some you don't even know about uh, that uh, we have ministry to, so continue to pray. Oh, by the way, we did get to see Joe Bay again, spend some time with him. Um, it was a blessing. It really was good to spend time. Uh, did I, I'm going to take a few minutes. I'm sorry if, I'm, if, if this is not the lesson you wanted this morning, but anyway. Uh, we uh, had visited Joe Bay a, a couple weeks ago, and, and Joe Bay was reminiscing about his time as a child. And he mentioned 
how much he liked licorice, and those licorice sticks with the hollow centers, mm -hmm. how he would bite the ends off, and then he would take them, use that as a straw in a, in a soda. And um, he, the, the happiness on his face and stuff, so what we did when we left there, we went and bought licorice sticks and sodas. <laughs> and so the next time we went, we'd give it to him. And so when we were there this time, he had a big smile on his face, and he reached into the drawer, and he said, I got two sticks left. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, that's one of the joys of, of giving. It really is. To see somehow somebody, you can, you can hear something they enjoy and then be able to give it back to them. What a blessing to be able to visit and, and, and speak with and, and converse with those who no longer have the freedom to get around and, and do what they want. What a ministry. What a blessing. Um, well, we praise the Lord for the opportunities He gives. And by the way, that will come up in our sermon today. Interesting enough. Anyway, Judges uh, chapter 11. We have gotten down to the end of... Actually, we did. We ended verse 11. We talked about... Uh, the, probably the last thing I said was about Jephthah uh, uh, actually living the Word of God. Uh, and, and, and how I put forth the question, are we? You know, do we truly understand what Job was saying when he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him? Can you imagine the situation as Job lay on that, and I picture it as an ash pile in a way. Uh, he talked about the shards of pottery that he scraped his boils. And, and, and in those days, you know, they didn't run down to the ER. They didn't have a family doctor, so to speak, like we do. They didn't have the medicines we do. So their trust in life uh, was totally in the Lord. And he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And then when the psalmist say, to uh, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him. The magnitude of the trust we're talking about in that day and age, we really don't have today. Who do we trust in? The doctor, the medicines. What the pharmacy can, if I can use this term, Conjuncture or, con or bring forth in, in his, uh, what do they call it? They, they, when they compounding, when they come back then, they'd probably call it witchcraft, but anyway, uh, compound. <laughs> I'm sorry, just say again, sir. Are you talking about their money? <laughs> they do that too, don't they? Daily, daily, yeah. Anyway, so we're down at. Uh, verse 11, it said that uh, then Jephthah uh, went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. So we've seen he went to the Lord. He was the only one here that did. And then we find in 12, we have a new something new beginning here. We, we find at this point and we read, it says, And Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What hast thou to do with me? that thou art come against me to fight in my land. Um, now, we're beginning, Jephthah here is, is, is we're beginning to see um, uh, him do that which the leaders of Gilead have chosen him out of all men of Gilead to do. Um, in this verse, I also see what uh, I, I find revealed to me, at least, why Jephthah asked of whom would be the leader? Would I be the leader or would somebody else? I begin to see his need. The leader or king, um, which, by the way, they don't call him. This is They're talking about a portion of Israel, I think, in this section. The, the, the leaders of Gilead. Not They don't mention Israel here. Uh, which They don't call him a king, but he is a leader. Has the right to negotiate with other leaders. What am I? Well, you know, what right would I have to go to talk to the, the, the president of any country and try to negotiate on the behalf of, of us uh, uh, as a country? I wouldn't have that. But as a leader of, of Gilead, he now has, because they've made him captain over the army, because he's now over the people, he has the right to negotiate with leaders of other kingdoms. He needed that ability. He needed the ability to be the one who knew what was being negotiated, first of all, the more people you get involved in a negotiation, the more that negotiation turns out into a can of worms. You ever looked at a can of worms? How many of you ever been fishing? <laughs> How many of you ever been fishing and used worms, real live worms? How many of you ever opened that jar up and found them worms to be in a ball? Down south, when we open that thing up, 
especially in the winter, it's a knot of worms. And you look at that thing and you're thinking, where does it begin and where does it end? <clears throat> but I'm thinking that's what negotiations are like. The more people you get in there, the more opinions they have. And you don't know what this one's saying or that one's saying. And, and I can understand why he wanted to be the leader, why he wanted to be the one over all the negotiation. He needed the ability to know what was being negotiated, to know what was being said from both sides. And as the one sending the messengers and receiving the message, he had that. So he needed the authority so that when he did send messengers, those who received them would also know he was a man of authority. It wasn't like he said this and then they said that. It wasn't like there was some other leader and that leader said, well, you know what, that was Jeff, he's the captain over the, the army. Don't worry about him, talk to me. Have you ever heard that statement? Don't worry about that, talk to me. I don't think you can do that in this situation. I think it would have caused a lot of confusion. And being the leader and being the captain, he would not only be the one doing negotiating, but he would also be one leading into battle. He had a vested interest in life. How often is that not true with leadership? There's no vested interest in the lives of those of whom you rule over and what happens to them. But he did. Um, you know, as I said, you know, we have to understand that the more people involved, the less clarity is and less understanding of, of what's actually understood as being communicated uh, back and forth. Come right on in. Yeah, you get there, you're all by yourself. Come right on in and take a seat. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I've already done it, so. <laughs> anyway, any seat, unless somebody's sitting in it. <clears throat> You know, we talked about the idea of, being, of communicating and negotiations uh, and the more people involved, the limitations um, you have on uh, understanding. Uh, let's say this. Let me re redefine it. We're in Judges chapter 11. We're on verse 12 at this point. Um, let's say this. If you have one person doing the negotiating, uh, there is clarity. It also limits misunderstandings but it also prevents something else. What is that? Very important we understand. If, if, if I have a conversation that I'm having with Vera, and I get somebody else, to, well, tell her this or tell her that, and she's not there to hear me, it allows that person, whether intentionally or intentionally, thank you. I knew something was wrong there. I hadn't caught it yet. And you know, I'm getting old. Either intentionally or unintentionally to subvert. What does that mean? Subvert. Take away from the authority of the other. It changes. Uh, it could be that they um, uh, change what's being said. Uh, I, how many of you ever uh, told somebody something and it come back to you and it's totally different? Mm -hmm. You know, that's subverting what was heard. It may be unintentionally after it goes. Isn't that exactly what Satan did with you? Sure, sure, exactly. <laughs> Um, he took and twisted the words of God. And so the, the more it goes through, the, the more polluted, the more opportunity, whether intended or unintended, that can happen. And so you don't want to, that to happen. So with that said, I think uh, he understood the need to have his power consolidated. He would know what was being said. He would have the authority to act as he saw the situation. He saw both sides of the equation and had the control to contain or advance it as he saw fit, what he believed was right. You know, and, and with taking that in mind and looking at what, he, what is said here, um, uh, I think that Jephthah was a man of, uh, I think he was very intelligent. And I think at this stage of the game, his wisdom for wanting to be the leader over these people, to lead all this, and not just the captain of the army, but actually lead the people, the negotiations, I think that's wisdom. I see now why the, the people of Gilead, the leaders of Gilead, come and chose him. See, we don't see that. We just read on the paper. He was a valiant, mighty man. But these things, you don't hide. This is part of his wisdom. This is part of his ability to, to uh, uh, his nature, if you would, his very character. And so I see a lot of that here. Um, you know what else I see? Not only their willingness to choose him to lead, uh, and give him the authority, but um, 
I also understand the jealousy of the half-brothers. I see that very clearly now. We talked about sometimes there are people that walk among us and when, they, when we see them, they automatically they get our respect. And I think not only was he that in appearance, but I think his character and his very nature, um, uh, his ability and his wisdom, I think it, can I use the term, oozed from him? I, I think it was obvious. Uh, I see uh, the jealousy. Uh, he was better than they. It becomes evident real queer, uh, quick, quickly. He did not have to flaunt his abilities. Uh, he would automatically have risen to the top among men just by his character and nature, even if he wasn't trying. Uh, they knew this to be true, by the way, or they wouldn't be jealous. It wouldn't have affected them at all. They knew this. They'd seen him and understood. But now, I'm going to say they hated him for it. Okay? Uh, why did they hate him? Why was his abilities, why was his character and nature such, if he was such a leader of men, that they hated him? We've discussed this some before. Prejudice. Prejudice? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Would you say their own insecurity? Because oh yeah, definitely. Very insecure. You know, um, envious of his abilities. Jealous, yeah. Um, there's something else I, I'm wondering just how much it plays into this. He was a, a, what I would consider, and please forgive me, I don't mean to be offensive, he was what they would probably consider a half-breed, right? <coughs> part Jewish, part something else. To Jews, all of us Gentiles are what? He's part dog. And he's better than me. I'm full-blooded. I'm a Jew. And he's better than me, and I know it. I think that's why they cast him out. I think that's the whole problem here. They understood that he was, in their eyes, he was a half-breed. He was more likely, in their opinion, a dog. Um, but yet he surpassed them. A mere, common, vile dog had more character, had more abilities. He was more of a person, uh, an honorable person, let's say, than they were. Now, how much would that have stirred him? <laughs> I think a lot. I think a lot. I think he surpassed him in character and integrity in a way um, uh, that drew other men. And because of all these things, men followed him, but they hated him. I think it's amazing when you think about it. All because of why? Why would they hate him so? Pride. Pride. That's all it was. That little bit of sin nature, that little bit of the flesh that we can't root out. It's always there. Um, so we have, um, uh, he begins his negotiation with the king of Ab uh, Ammonites. He, he is in our terms simply asking, why are you picking a fight with me? He says, um, uh, what hast thou to do with me? That thou art come against me to fight in my land. So he's, he's actually, he's wanting to know. He says, uh, uh, why, why are you picking a fight with me? Why are, uh, why are we facing uh, open the, these open hostilities with you? He's seeking to find out the cause of the problem. Again, wisdom. How do you cure an issue if you don't know what caused the issue? How do you take care of a, a, a conflict between personalities if you don't know what's causing it? He has to find out. He has to know. You know so he's searching this out. He, what he's doing, he's, he's, he's thinking in his mind, I, I, I would believe, I, in my opinion, he said in order to find a, a remedy or a solution, he said, I really need to find out what's going on here because I really don't know. Um, if I'm going to resolve this and restore peace to my people, I need to find out why these people, what have we done to them that has caused this issue to come up? Um, so, what has thou to do with me? Tell me the reason you've begun this transgression against us. He didn't know. He wanted to know uh, what was so serious, and, and the last part says that thou art come against me to fight in my land. 
And that's pretty serious. Why are you invading us? Why hasn't there been some other communication if there's been an offense? You ever walked up to somebody and, and talked with them and, and it's just like, and you're like, well, what did I do? You ever had that happen? I used to have that happen when I stayed out late and didn't call home. <clears throat> she laughs, but she knows it's true. I learned better. I don't do that no more. Um, we normally, if we have a problem, well, I can't say that. The best response if we have a problem, I don't think we normally do this, is to let somebody, the, the person we have the problem with know that we have a problem. I think generally we don't. We keep our mouth shut until it kind of festers and comes up when things could have been rectified if we just, what we call, aired it out. If we just say, listen, this is what's going on, this is what you said, and this is what's bothering me. And usually the person says, I didn't mean it that way. That's not what I said. Who told you that? You know, or something like that. And so apparently what we're seeing here is there's been no communication on the matter. There's been uh, uh, no... Uh, it gives me the impression um, this probably had not been long, but it could have been long, and, and the leadership really did not know how to communicate with the king in order to rectify the issue. So Jephthah now, he's taking that, demo, that democratic... Oh, my goodness. Diplomatic approach. <clears throat> this is not going my way, is it? Um, why does he do that? Well, not only does he to, to find out what the issue is so he can solve the problem, but he would rather go an approach that was nonviolent. He is going to be the captain. He is going to take these people to war. He is now not only the, 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 the leader of the country responsible for all men, but he's also got a vested responsibility in those that he's going to lead into battle. Oh, yeah, I would want a diplomatic uh, solution as well. I wouldn't want to go into battle, especially in those days when any cut or injury could um, become infected and take your life. Um, he understood the value of lives. Again, I say I really appreciate where he's at. Um, with him taking a diplomatic approach, with him trying to solve this without going to war, he's not only saving Israelites, he's saving the Ammonites. Now what importance has that? What's the importance of that? Why save an enemy's life? Then they become allies after? I want the other side. Say again? To reflect God's um, image on their I accept all that, but there's something we're missing. If they take a life of an Ammonite, what happens to the family that lost a life? Bitterness. I've lost a loved one. I can't forgive Israel. I don't want this war to end. I want revenge. See, what you said is all true, but we're missing that other point. We want to bring the light, which being for both sides is a big help. But there's also the side, if they start taking lives, you start losing Israelites, you start losing Ammonites, the people get angry. Righteous indignation. It's my right to take a life. I can take revenge. Escalation. It comes from a little thing to a big thing. You ever been in an argument that escalated? <laughs> you laugh, but you know it's true. And so it continues, it grows. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want to get that. I he would much rather save a life on both sides that there might be peace. Because if you can't have peace because somebody has taken a life that was dear to you, then there's not going to be peace. And he understood that. Wise man, a very wise man. Um, he understood the value of life. He understood what it meant to take life. He understood the effect it would have in taking lives. Um, do you think you could take a life even if you won the war without it having an effect on your life? No. War is a loss. There's, there's more uh, to that as well. Uh, the war in Ukraine is a perfect example, and I'll use that for a moment. One side believes that they are 
able to go in and conquer other side unchallenged. But yet, now, shock of all shocks, looks what's happened. You never know what's going to happen when you start a war. You never know who the winner is. You never know how much you'll lose. You never know what the cost is, how long it'll last. Some wars last years. Some wars are continuing to this day that have been started long ago. And we don't hear about them anymore because they're no longer news, you know. They've, they've died off. The hatred between the Muslims and the Jews. When did that start? <laughs> How long has it been going? When will it stop? You understand. Fomenting these things, no one wins. Uh, we see him underst uh, an understanding here of that. Uh, I see here him taking control, seeking answers, and then wanting to use the proper application of the knowledge, that wisdom that he has. Um, to know what he needs to do and then do what's needed. Um, I really like uh, his character and his nature. Uh, I believe him to be a man of great integrity at this point. Um, let's go to 13. It says, And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah. So now... We have an insight from what we had so far. We've had a little insight into the mind of Jephthah, and I think we've seen some of his character. We've seen how uh, precious lives are, I believe, in his mind. I think we see his, his wisdom. He's got integrity. Uh, I really think we see into his heart. So now we're going to get an opportunity to examine a little bit the, 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 the king of the children of Ammon. And he answered unto the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land. You know, that's a pretty good reason to go to war, isn't it? Somebody has come in and invaded your land. They've taken the land. They, in the process of taking land, they probably killed people. They're probably taking captives. Now, you see what I'm talking about, anger. So this is not a bad reason to go to war. It's actually a very good reason to go to war. So as we begin, um, we understand, first of all, he is a king. All right, so he has... All authority to call men to die in battle, even if it is for no reason. He is a king that would be, and as a king, he would be unchallenged in his power to rule over the people in many areas. Um, and if you remember Abimelech, you also remember that uh, people in leadership are always not good at leading. They make a lot of bad decisions at times. So anyway, <clears throat> he had, as one who was a king, a lot of authority and, and, and once you place somebody over you, uh, especially in the situation we see here, that power is not easily rescinded. How do you take back the liberty to rule over you when you give it to somebody? Especially in their day and age. It would be, it'd be very difficult. Um, what happens if he ended up being a bad king? How would they gain control from him? Mutiny. Uprising. Who's going to stand against him? Where they could get men to back them. So, you know, it put them in a different, uh, difficult situation. And understanding also, um, people are not known for choosing the best people for leadership. Look back through time at those who've been uh, chosen to lead. Um, why? Why do we seem to always put the worst person in? Not that we always do. But you look at those that have been bad at times. How did they get in? How did they get that place of authority? Yes, sir. Sometimes through emotion. Through emotion. Yeah. Well, hold on to that one. Through emotion. Well, yeah, we voted. Why did we vote them in, though? Because they promised us something that we wanted. Okay. So emotions, they promised us something. They had an appeal for us. Now, that's really enough. So I'll make this statement. The reason we get bad people in over us is because we don't use the right criteria to elect them. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Emotional appeal is not the right criteria. Because they appeal to our uh, senses, if you would, and they appeal to us by promising. There's always a promise of cutting taxes. We're going to reduce your taxes. That's the biggest lie I've ever heard. <laughs> taxes don't go down. They get manipulated at times, but they don't go down. Oh, they'll bring them down here and take them up here. Uh, anyway, you understand what I'm saying. Um, in those days, maybe the man would have been uh, chosen to be king because he had a great physical character. He might be popular. He might be strong enough to take the throne. There was different ways to get in. Um, 
But that didn't make an individual a good king or leader, does it? And so we need to understand, it may give them the power to lead, but it does not always, uh, you, you do have some, you don't always have the natural ability to lead. Um, so the king's answer to Jephthah is going to really tell us much on how he views this situation. So because Israel took the land, a righteous cross, I don't think we're going to contend that. Um, I think a good king will always seek, a good leader even, will always seek to protect his people. But when the king qualifies that statement, uh, he says, But when Israel took away my land, when they came out of Egypt, I would say this fellow holds a grudge. He wasn't even alive when this happened, I don't think. So you have to look at this thing for a minute. He says, Because Israel took away my land when he came out of Egypt. How long did how long ago did Israel come out of Egypt? And why now? Why all the big deal now? Um, I think this king does accurately portray the events in which the Ammonites lost the land. I think but his assumption that his lands first of all are his is wrong. And I think they're not based in wisdom nor I do not believe they're the assumptions of one who is thinking correctly. And I think this is where uh, Jephthah uh, really excels when he, gets, when he begins to reply back. So what's he doing? So what is this king doing? He's trying to reason with him. He Go ahead. seems to be using the past. Like we see this playing out over and over and over again. You know, my grandparents were slaves. Therefore, oh, yeah. thou owest me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like it's, it's excuses, right? To put on somebody else the blame for your circumstances. I think you're right. He is using this. Um, and I think that could be um, a key issue in there. Uh, I want to take that a little bit further. I think he is looking for a fight with Israel. And he's using this as a legitimate reason to war. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, is it? Is it legitimate? Um, from what Jephthah says later and gives the timing of it, I'd say no. But we don't see that yet in Scripture. But then when a person is looking for a fight, he's going to eventually find a fight, is he not? When somebody's just bent on, on causing destruction, they're going to cause destruction. You, you really... Um, any you got that so right um, so thinking about that why would a king seek to war on this reason alone I think there's several reasons uh, to, to stack on to what uh, Sue said first he's, I think he's seeking to make a name for himself oh they lost this 300 years ago or whatever it was and now I'm going to be known for getting it back I'm going to make a name for myself. My name is going to be mentioned in the angles of history. Well, they are. But not for what he thought they was going to be mentioned for. So I think he's, he's, he's making, he wants to make some a name for himself. And what greater way to do that than when he can find him a weakened neighbor or a nation that he perceives to be weak and go in and capture them. Now what happens if he wins the war? What happens to Israel if he wins the war? Those people that he's looking to capture. Now, I don't think it's all of Israel. It's just the leaders of Gilead and their, the tribe of Gilead or the people of Gilead. What happened in war in those days? All right. First of all, the people who either get killed or taken captive. What happens to their belongings? Plundered. That's the spoils of war. So he enriches his people, he enriches himself, because he's going to get a cut of everything they get. He'll get so many slaves, he can sell them or keep them. He gets so much of the cattle, so much of the livestock, he gets so much of the gold or whatever is found. He gets so much of that. So he's looking not only to get some honor, but he's looking to increase his wealth. You know, he's, So he's just looking for a way. Oh, this is a weaker a neighbor, they, they really can't defend themselves. Um, spoils to the victor. And I'm going to be the victor. I think he had big dollar signs 
He didn't just want the land. He wanted the wealth. He wanted the honor. He wanted to make a name. So I think he was being moved by pride. I think he was looking to elevate himself in the eyes of men to be praised. Deadly things. Pride and seeking praise. Yes, ma'am. Even while he's speaking peace because he had to restore those lands peaceably. Yeah, which is a blatant lie because he's already started war. Exactly. Yeah, I agree with you fully. Now, let's switch gears for a little bit. Spiritually, the spiritual war here, what's happening? Because you, know, you, you understand everything that happens has a spiritual impact. There's a reason uh, we're seeing this. And I think if you go back to Elijah and seeing all those the chariots of fire and things, you begin to understand that there's always a spiritual war raging. And so what's happening? Yes, ma'am. Well, the Messiah is going to come out of Israel, so Satan's always trying to destroy Israel. To exactly. To exactly. We don't know the extent that he, this man could have, but you have to understand. We always understand that, that we know that the Redeemer had not been yet born, and Satan did not want him to be born because he didn't want the Messiah and he didn't want our Savior. And what happens if the seed could be destroyed? The Messiah would never come. The Savior would never die on Calvary's cross. We'd have no path of reconciliation to God. And Satan would destroy the plan of God. He would make God a liar. He would defeat God. So he thought. You don't defeat God or he would not be God. Um, so again, we'll go back to what you said about peaceably. And we have the audacity of this king in saying, therefore restore these lands again peaceably. He knew that was not going to happen. He had no intention of allowing that to happen. And the one who was driving him, the power behind him, Satan had no intention of that happening. If they had peaceably given this land back, do you think it would have stopped there? Oh no, I don't think so either. I think he was looking to destroy Israel. I think that's exactly what uh, Satan was trying to get him to do. I think he was being moved by Satan. I think he would have conquered. I think he would have taken as much as he could. And if you go back now into chapter 6, and you see the first part of chapter 6, and, and let's just go there and read real quick. Um, because I, we've gotten far enough away and I move slow enough like that big turtle that we forget. <laughs> The children of Israel did evil, and this is verse 1, in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains and the caves and strongholds. And so it was, when Israel had sown, that Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of East, even they came against them, and they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth. Till thou come unto Gaza, and left no substance for the Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle in their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And the Israel was what? Greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. You understand, that's the intent. They're going to destroy the land and impoverish God's people. My, just so you understand, that has not changed since that day till now. They still seek to destroy the children of God, whether it be in Israel, whether it be here. They still seek to impoverish us. It's going to happen until our Savior comes again. It's not going to change. Any statements or, or questions before we close? I just want to say that's like listening to yesterday's news. You know, like <laughs> they want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Yeah. It is. You're right. Peace, peace, peace. We want that state so we can have peace. That's not what they're after. Not at all. Um, like I say, we and like Sue just said as well, we've seen this already. Um, the way of the people and, and even in the book of Judges, the, the judges that God used in Israel, what the pattern has already been established here. And we see sinful people getting conquered. We see the judges deliver them. We see they start serving God. And then we see them fall back into sin. Da, 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 da. And it's going to be that way. It's going to be that way. So anyway, all right, we are dismissed. We'll, we'll be back on the hour.